Well, I am back at Oak Hill Cemetery and it's October, so I thought it would be very interesting to do a video on some ghostly, ghastly, and chilling stories from Oak Hill Cemetery. So come along and join me. Be sure to watch to the end of this video and I will share with you a strange and perhaps ghostly experience that I had at Oak Hill Cemetery. Let's begin with a chilling story of three men who died from exposure to a deadly gas in the same year. 1939 was a year that three men died of exposure to cyanide gas in Battle Creek in two separate accidents. In June of 1939, Ernest West, a real estate salesman and owner of several cottages on Gogwak Lake, was intending to fumigate a vacant cottage that he owned and was later found in a storeroom with an open jar of about a quart and a half of cyanide gas solution. The coroner said that he had been very experienced with the handling of cyanide gas and it must have been an accident. The second incident occurred in October that same year. Archie Seeley, the proprietor of a tavern on Porter Street died alongside a man that he had asked him to help fumigate his building with cyanide. The men began work at approximately 3 a.m. and about 5 a.m. a passerby saw the two bodies laying on the floor through the front glass windows. Seeley had been in the chemical warfare business in his service during World War I and was also very familiar with the handling of the deadly gas. The man who was helping Archie Seeley with the fumigate project was an unemployed laborer by the name of Jay Mosher. Ernest West was buried at Oak Hill Cemetery and Archie Seeley was buried there as well. Jay Mosher was buried in a cemetery near Soresco according to the newspaper clippings but I was not able to find any record of a cemetery in that area or a cemetery record anywhere in the state of Michigan for the man. In both of these unfortunate accidents the gas was being used to exterminate roaches and vermin. It is always tragic to a family when a loved one dies. When the story becomes a compounded loss, it ceases to be merely the death of a loved one, but a more chilling tale. Such was the story of the Buckley family. George Buckley was a longtime resident on Chestnut Street with his wife Ellen. He was an accomplished musician, having spent time in Prague teaching and playing music for many years. In fact, he'd spent 12 years studying the violin and had frequently performed at the Bijou Theater in Battle Creek. His wife Eleanor was a distinguished musician herself when she made her debut before an audience of 8,000 people in the Prince Albert Theater in London. In 1935, the Buckleys returned to Battle Creek. He was a conductor of the Kalamazoo Symphony Orchestra. In 1951, George and Eleanor moved to Mesa, Arizona in hopes of improving the health of George. Unfortunately, in July 1952, he passed away in Mesa, Arizona. His body was placed on a train and sent to Battle Creek for burial. Mrs. Buckley and her daughter, Jean Butler, who lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and was also a music teacher and artist herself, drove in their car from Mesa to Santa Fe with the intention of catching a plane to Chicago and meeting the rest of the family in Battle Creek. While on their way, they were involved in a three-car accident in Las Lunas, New Mexico, just south of Albuquerque, and both were killed. The funeral for Mr. Buckley was delayed until August 10th, where all three were buried together in the family plot. Now let's visit the peculiar story of Frank Milton Eddy, the man who was buried in two parts over 30 years. Frank Milton Eddy was the county clerk for over 40 years in Calhoun County. In 1938 he bruised the ankle of his left foot when entering an automobile when the car door swung open unexpectedly. Ten months later he underwent an amputation of his leg below the knee because of tumors that had formed after this freak accident. According to the book Beyond These Gates, there are two burial records for Frank Milton Eddy. In 1939, when his leg was amputated, the foot of Frank is indicated as having been buried on February 1st. The rest of Frank lived until 1973, where he died of congestive heart failure. He was reunited with his leg upon burial. 
No video on ghostly stories of Oak Hill Cemetery would be complete without visiting the grave of Johannes Decker and the legend of the Crying Mary. The urban legend about the statue of a woman over this grave has spawned many an imaginative tale. The statue is often referred to as the Crying Mary and the legend has it that the statue cries every night at midnight. <laughs> The details surrounding this quite imaginative story claims that the grave is that of a woman who murdered her three children and the statue cries in despair over the loss, etc, etc. There's a lot of variations of the story. As exciting and spooky as this myth sounds, restrain yourself from jumping fences in the middle of the night. What I'm about to tell you is probably going to disappoint a lot of ghost hunters. Alas, the stories are a myth. It is only a fabrication of colorful imaginations. Let's punch a few holes in this legend. Number one, Johannes Decker was a man. He was a successful dry goods salesman in the city of Battle Creek. Number two, yes, there was probably a lot of sorrow involved in his death. His widow, Ruth Decker, commissioned the statue of a Greek goddess, not the Virgin Mary, to stand over his grave from an artist out of Chicago, probably to express her own sorrow at the loss of her beloved husband. The statue is of bronze, and over time, a patina formed on the face as the rain fell, causing streaks on the face of the statue. Here are some photos of what the statue looked like when the patina had formed. These streaks have long since been sandblasted back to their original beauty. And finally, there were only two children. One died of scarlet fever at the age of three, and the other was stillborn. So. There's no gruesome murders here. However, I've stood before this statue in the pouring rain and my glasses did fog. Does that count? All right, let's move on. Now this next story is about a very real woman who lived in Battle Creek and did indeed commit the crime of murdering her three children. Sarah Rathbone was born in 1826 in New York. She married Ira Haviland in July of 1846 and moved to Michigan, and they lived near Augusta Township. She was widowed in 1857. She married again in 1859 to a man named John Leonard. They divorced before 1865, and she assumed the name of Haviland again after this divorce. She had six children. William and Jane were the children of Ira Haviland, as were Phoebe and Arthur. Phoebe was born in 1854. Arthur was born in 1857. I was not able to determine when William was born. She had two other children with John Leonard. John H. Leonard was born 1859, and Mary Elizabeth Leonard was born in 1861. In 1865, she came to live in Battle Creek and became a very enthusiastic convert to the spiritualistic creed, as Battle Creek at that time was the stronghold for the spiritualists in the state of Michigan. She made arrangements to go spread the word about spiritualism around the region with a man by the name of Dr. Daniel Baker. Now, various accounts of what happened next is written across several different articles from very different viewpoints. They all seem to unanimously share the common agreement that he held a great deal of control and influence over her. One of the accounts claims that he told her the only bar to marriage with him was her children, that he did not want the children. So the two of them together Unbelievable as this is to process, crafted the sinister plan to eliminate the children. On December 16th, 1865, she mixed a cocktail of arsenic, sulfur, and molasses and gave it to her three younger children, Arthur, who was aged eight, John, who was aged six, and Mary Elizabeth, who was only four. Apparently, the three older children came home when the three younger ones were in spasms and she tried to get them to also drink, but they refused. Dr. Baker apparently dug the graves in advance and later built a shanty over the top where they buried the children. 
Now the couple went on for almost six months before they were found out. How this came to be, the records of that was not available. We can only assume that perhaps a neighbor or a fellow member of the congregation began asking what happened to the children, or perhaps the surviving children eventually reported the matter to the police. The couple were eventually investigated and found out, and Dr. Baker and Sarah Havlin were given life sentences on June 7, 1866. Baker died two years into his sentence. Sarah spent 30 years in prison. She was the only woman in Jackson State Penitentiary for 30 years, and an article in 1896 said her prison number was number 20 because she had been there so long. In early 1896, she was sent to Detroit to a all-female prison. In May of that same year, she was pardoned by Governor Rich. And the announcement of this made national newspapers, and here are some examples of different parts of the country where the story was carried. After she was pardoned, I found conflicting stories about what happened to her. In the newspaper accounts, it indicated that she had made arrangements to go live with her daughter in Canada. So that must have been her older daughter, Jane, who was buried in Tecumseh, Ontario, because Phoebe died in 1910 and was buried near Lansing. And then also I saw another report that she lived the remaining part of her days alone in a boarding house in Detroit until she died in 1906. At least one of her children was buried at Oak Hill Cemetery for a short time as per an interview by Ogden Green. You can see my video on him and hear about this story. Before the child's body was dug up and removed at the request of the family and reburied in a cemetery in Ypsilanti at the old Alban Cemetery. They were all three removed again and moved to the new Albin Cemetery in 1886. This incident sent a shockwave through the Battle Creek community all across the county and the state of Michigan when the trial unfolded and the two were sentenced. I did find one newspaper that was in German over in Minnesota that carried this story at the time when she and Baker were sentenced. There's not many remaining newspaper clippings from that period of time, so the full extent of the coverage I can't share with you in this video. But nevertheless, it is one of the most disturbing and ghastly stories in the annals of local history. It was slightly over 20 years later that another disturbing and sinister crime happened that shook the growing community of Battle Creek to its foundations. Now, I deliberated long and hard as to whether to include this story, as it's pretty dark. And then I thought, you know, every video about a chilling and ghastly stories needs to have a dash of the old axe murderer, so, so that we can keep people looking over their shoulders when they go out for the mailbox on those dark and stormy nights. So therefore, I decided to include it. So let's roll with it. However, you're probably going to want to queue up a few puppy videos to watch right after you hear this story to bring you back from the dark side. I'm just warning you. This event was one that many who lived in that time quickly wanted to forget. The story begins with a man named Martin White. Now, please note, he is in no way related to the famous James and Ellen White of the Adventist Church. There's no familial connection whatsoever. Dr. Martin White had been a student in Ann Arbor when he met his wife-to-be, Frances Reeve, in the 1860s. He graduated Detroit Medical College in 1870 and married Frances the following year. After graduation, he commenced to practice in Davison over in Genesee County and then opened an office later in Ann Arbor and later still practiced in Dundee before finally arriving in Battle Creek in 1874. Shortly after their arrival, the Whites' first child named May was born. Eight years later, they had a second child named Bessie. Dr. White struggled as a physician. The Sunday Morning Call newspaper at the time described him as, quote, the doctor was a man who did not take with the people. He had no faculty for making acquaintances and had but few friends. He got but little practice and soon lost even that little. He was not really an intelligent man and was not regarded as a skillful physician. He was very conceited and had great faith in his own ability as a doctor. They described him as having possessed an unhappy disposition and was naturally melancholy. 
So that kind of describes the character of Dr. White, or at least how he was perceived by those who knew him. After they were married, Mrs. White had received money from her father's estate after he had passed away. This occurred shortly after they moved to Battle Creek. As the doctor never made any money with any practice that he attempted, they lived off her inheritance. It was reported that when Dr. White learned she had inherited some land from the estate, he locked her in a room without food or water for several days until she finally agreed to sign a deed for the sale of the land. So in December of 1885, Dr. White, with deed in hand, traveled to Ann Arbor to dispose of the land, and then he returned to Battle Creek shortly after New Year's, 1886. There were reports that he was seen returning either on Saturday the 2nd or Sunday the 3rd. However, a week passed and the neighbors noticed they had not seen Dr. White or his wife or the children since the prior Sunday. So finally on Friday, a neighbor went over to the house, saw that the curtains were drawn. So she peeked in through a crack and believed she saw blood stains on the floor. So she convinced her husband, Miles Sharkey, to enter the house, which he did with another man by the name of Mr. Quarter. And this is what they discovered. As they stepped from the woodshed into the kitchen, Mr. Sharkey opening the partially closed door, a horrible sight met their gaze. There in front of the cook stove lay the bodies of White and his wife with their throats cut, cold and dead. Mr. Corder exclaimed, oh, where are the children? And ran up the stairs. He came bounding down again and cried, oh my God, they are murdered. So the scene was pretty grisly. They found the children upstairs with their throat cut. Mrs. White laying next to Dr. White. She had a razor blade laying on top of her. There was a kitchen knife covered with blood on the handle sitting on top of the stove. There was also a bloody ax laying behind the stove with clumps of hair on it. And there was another pool of blood in front of a mirror in the back bedroom. So the theory was that while Mrs. White was at church on Sunday afternoon, Dr. White hit the children with an ax and then cut their throats. He then waited for his wife to return from church. And when she entered the kitchen, he struck her with the ax. There was probably a struggle that ensued and he broke the razor in trying to cut her throat. And then he went over into the bedroom and tried to cut his own throat, but the razor didn't work because it was now broken. So he walked back into the kitchen, threw the razor on top of Mrs. White, tried to cut his own throat with the kitchen knife. That didn't go so well. So finally, he used a pocket knife and cut his own throat as they found the pocket knife underneath him. An inquest was held and the ultimate determination was that it was a murder-suicide. All the doors inside the house were locked from the inside and the windows had all had the curtains drawn since the prior Sunday. Adding another twist to the story was an eyewitness who claimed to have seen the doctor on Wednesday night in front of his office. If that was true, did he kill his family on Sunday and wait three days before offing himself? Was his original plan really to kill himself? Was it really a plan to be a murder-suicide? Or was he planning to kill his family, leave town with the money, then his conscience got the best of him or he got scared? We don't know. The aftermath was essentially a very shocked community. Francis's family came to Battle Creek and arranged for her and the children to be buried in Ann Arbor. They told the coroner that they did not want anything to do with Dr. White's body and basically left town, leaving his body in the hands of the coroner. So Dr. White was buried at Oak Hill Cemetery. He's in an unmarked grave, except there is a small uncarved rock in the plot where he was buried. So perhaps that's how they marked his grave. There was no religious service at his burial and no one from the town attended. In fact, there was an article that the neighbors wanted to tear down the house 
right after the incident happened, as no one wanted to live there and they didn't like being around it. There's another article mentioning where they were raising money to have it moved to a field and burned to the ground. What actually happened to that house, I wasn't able to find the final outcome, but it was essentially destroyed and removed and it no longer exists. So cue the puppy videos, take a deep breath, and if you happen to bring a puppy to Oak Hill Cemetery, be sure and have them pee on that rock. So after seeing some of these stories, you might wonder, or maybe asking yourself if have I myself had any ghostly experiences in the time that I've been coming and filming at cemeteries and researching the history of some of the stories I presented on my channel. And I'm not a real big thinker in the terms of the realm of ghosts and that sort of thing. Um, that's a whole different type of thing and that's not really the purpose of my channel. But I would have thought I would share an interesting story of one of my experiences in filming here. There was one very particular grave that I filmed in my first time filming here. And I had filmed several clips and things to use in the video. And when I got home, all the other footage I'd filmed that day was on the camera except that one gravesite. And I must have filmed probably seven or eight clips, different angles and things. And I couldn't find it anywhere, which was really weird. And I thought, well, maybe I made a mistake and deleted it accidentally or something. So I came back a few days later to refilm it. And, um, well, in doing so, when I was approaching the gravesite, this time my camera started to malfunction. I thought it was a little weird, and I'd never had that malfunction before. So I walked back to my truck, and I grabbed a different camera, put a new fresh battery in it, and I went there and I managed to get the footage I needed. Now you're probably gonna question, what grave were you filming? It was the Ellen White plot that whole family plot there of the Whites. And a very peculiar, very odd experience. The camera would never malfunction before. So was there some energy or something to do with that or was it all a coincidence? In the spirit of Halloween, the spirit of October, I'll let you be the judge. Well, that's gonna conclude this video about the ghostly, ghastly, and chilling stories from Oak Hill Cemetery. I hope you enjoyed the presentation today. If you liked today's video, please leave me a like, leave me a comment, tell me what you thought. Subscribe to the channel if you're new here, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.